Nityanandam Paramasudam Kevalam Yanamurtim Vandavati Tam Bagana Shadishkum Tatvamasya Rilakshtam Ekam Nityam Vimalamachalam Sarvati Sakshi Bhutam Bhavati Tam Trigana Rahitam Sadguram Namami Nityanandam Hi, this is Manitya Ovyananda. Today I am looking through the Living Enlightenment book because it's March, and March is the month, March 3rd is the anniversary of this amazing book. Swamiji released this book in 2009 on March 3rd. So all month uh, I'll be going through various chapters as I've been uh, opening up different pages and sharing with you. And one of my favorite topics in the whole world is the master-disciple relationship, or we can say, to be a little more politically correct, so other people can understand. Not everybody understands what it means by master. It sounds like a little weird, especially coming from U.S., because there's many negative connotations to the word master. Uh, a lot of African Americans were held in slavery, held captive, uh, and their their captives, their owners, so to speak, were called masters. So I don't want to give the wrong idea by this. I'm. And I'm purely meaning when we say master, that we're talking about the one who has mastered the cosmos, the master of the cosmos, the master uh, of enlightenment. Uh, it's just been a traditional word used for the guru in Buddhism and in Hinduism. So now we're, we don't really use that word as much because uh, maybe it is misunderstood, but it has been a very a uh, popular term used in Eastern traditions. So, I'm reading about this particular passage, which I really love talking about Swamiji, and of course, the relationship he has with all the different disciples. The relationship you have with the Guru, with the Master, is different. As different as there are snowflakes, there are relationships with the Master. So everything is unique. He treats you in a unique manner as the being needs. What does the being need to learn and go through? What does the being need to experience and complete with? What karmas are there? Each being is different. So every being is like a snowflake in a way and how the master handles and deals with you. And a lot of people ask me, well, how do I know when I found somebody, when I found the master? How does the seeker know? Uh, and Swamiji uh, puts it in here really nice, so I'm going to read it. Uh, when you reach the master, this question, is he my master or not, will disappear, disappear, be very clear, Swamiji says. People ask me, should we accept you as our master? I tell them, never do that mistake. No, I never promote myself. I can never tell you to accept me as your master. If I'm your master, there will be something beyond your intellect. You will not be able to forget me. Now I challenge, if you can forget me, forget, then I am not your master. Relax and continue your seeking. You will get the right master, don't worry. Swami just says that. I can hear him saying, if you can't forget me, if you can't forget me, forgive me, only then I'm your master. I always tell people, Never accept me as a master. If I am your master, I will be there in your mind the whole day and night. I will be there even in your dreams. If thoughts of me fill your day and night, then I am your master. And it's very true. Uh, I mean, now it's so part of my life that I don't even notice, but it's pretty much how everything revolves around our master, around Swamiji. And why is that? Because... We basically have to infuse everything we do with the teachings, with Swamiji's life, as an example of how to live, how to live according to the Agamas as, as uh, Sada Shiva has given us. Because each aspect of that brings us to the space of enlightenment. So how does Swamiji live? How does he treat people? How does he do the rituals every day? Every day he does his pujas, every morning. How does he treat people with love, compassion, respect, how does he handle situations with ferociousness and knowledge and micromanagement? And how does he teach? He downloads, the, he downloads from the cosmos. He even tells how 
when he downloads from the cosmos is in Sanskrit. So then he has to, you see him sometimes, kind of stop a little while. But he has to translate it from Sanskrit to English or Tamil, depending on which uh, group of people he's speaking to. So it's amazing, you know, to watch his life and to understand the ultimate life of living in life. So who is the best example? A living master, a Swamiji, or an incarnation, an enlightened being who has already realized, has that self-realization, is a Jivan Mukti. And our Swamiji is so much more than that. He is the avatar, the embodiment of Sadashiva in the human form. So the best way is to learn directly from him. And just, uh, I just love reading about this because it's true. I remember when I first uh, took my program with Swamiji and I bought a book and actually it was called Rising in Love with the Master because I had no idea what any of these things meant. So I, shortly after I did the first, first program, I, I purchased that book and I also read Autobiography of the Yogi because I wanted to understand what did the guru-disciple relationship mean? What was it about? I had no idea. I didn't understand it. You know, the only thing I can uh, relate to is, you know, some of the stories I read about the the wizards and the, uh, you know, apprentices they had or something, you know. But what really does it mean? Because there's a connection there that can't be explained. It's beyond logic. It is deep. And part of who you are, your being knows. So you can't forget. You think, what did he say? What did he mean? You know, you look at photos, you, because, and we talk about this, you know, that Swamiji is not a, a normal person, you know, there's something about Swamiji, because he's divine. But even if you don't know that, you keep yourself looking at his photos, and you don't know why. I mean, uh, to some people, they don't understand, it's like, there, it's just some man. But Swamiji exudes and radiates that grace, and that divine energy, and that beauty. And that magnificence. So when you look at him, no matter what he's doing, he can be sitting there looking at his iPad, or he can be walking or eating lunch. Pretty much anything he's doing is, for me, it, it's enthralling, enthralling me. And I can just pretty much look at him all the time. So what is about it? It seems strange, right? But it's the most fulfilling thing because connecting to him. We're connecting to him and his energy. He's transmitting at all times that energy to us and radiating to us. And he's just simply trying to have us connect to that, to that oneness space. So however we handle that, however we can connect to him, he lets us in that space, you know. Sometimes we might feel more comfortable seeing him eat because he is such a divine being. And when we see him, especially in Samadhi, when during the Tarshans, it's a totally different side of him than when you're seeing him have lunch. But he tries to connect to everybody in various ways and especially what makes them comfortable or what they connect with and relate to. Because he'll, he'll handle everything, you know, from being the guru to the father to the mother figure to the, uh, you know, the person who can joke with you because he's very funny also. You know, so all of these different ways to make you feel comfortable connect with him. So. That is the beauty of that. Because he's only here to raise our consciousness, to raise us to the super conscious level through the transmission of powers of Sada Shiva, through all of the teachings. He wants us to be in that space also, to share that with him, to manifest and radiate the powers of Sada Shiva, that oneness space with the cosmos. Because we're not mere human beings as we think. We are super conscious beings. And by getting into that space and understanding, whether it's from a joke or from a conversation or from his satsangs or his darshan, however we can connect to him is the best way for us to understand and to get in the space of oneness, that Shaktipada. So pretty much everything I've mentioned, I've connected to with Swamiji. I don't know. I can't think of anything I have not. Uh, that I've seen or experienced connected to. So I'm a little 
biased, I guess. But anyhow, he goes on and uh, speaks a little more about this topic, and he says, uh, people ask me, Swamiji, should I remember you? Should I meditate on you? I tell them no. Forgetting me will be the problem. Remembering me will not be the problem. Only then I am your master. If you can forget me, forget and continue your journey. That's good for you. If you're not able to forgive me, then I am your master. Even if you have one doubt in one corner, that is a solid proof I am not your master. So relax. Don't struggle. Don't suffer. Don't torture yourself. Just say a beautiful goodbye and continue. My love, respects, and best wishes for you reach the right master, the master who is for you. I myself have sent many disciples to many masters. I have guided many people that way. That is not like a shop. Oh, he's, sorry. He says, this is not like a shop. It is not as though you come to my shop. You can't go to another shop. It is not a business. I always tell people that even if you are my disciple, do not stop learning from all other masters. Pluck flowers from all gardens and make a beautiful bouquet for yourself. After all, life is to be enriched. So with that, the only thing I can say is Swamiji has all flowers and bouquets in his garden, so I don't need to go anywhere else. And I am grateful that he's my master and my Swamiji. Yeah,